Yes, I want to hear. I want to hear. Every chance I get to speak up here, I've been um, asking Heidi to use questions that illuminate who you are. And so I want to know more about you. Ricky, what was so funny? Uh, he, Tom said Event Horizon. Event Horizon. I, I agree. It's so scary. Really? I've never seen it. You get very scary? Then I will not see it. Okay. Um, anyone else? Who, who had a movie that, um, that it, it's just ingrained in you? It like has had an effect on you? Paranormal activity. What? Paranormal activity. Paranormal activity. Sorry, I thought I heard Camelot. I was like, what? Oh, uh, paranormal activity. Oh, did you watch it by yourself? Uh, with oh, you watched it with friends. Are you still friends with them? Yeah. Okay. Good, good. How about someone on this side? How about David Potts? What's the scariest movie you've ever seen? Uh, the Stand. The Stand? Yeah, it's like a Stephen King movie. Oh, Steve, oh wow, Stephen King. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, anyone want to know mine? Yeah. yeah. Mine is Divine, Sis, uh, Divine Sisterhood of the, what is it, Traveling Pants? <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Divine, Divine. Divine Yaya Sister. Oh, no, just kidding. No, um, actually, when I was 12... My parents took me to their friend's house, and uh, back in those days, uh, there, there was no such thing as streaming, no, no such thing as on-demand. If you didn't have cable, you had uh, a few channels, right? You had two, right? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes, two people know what I'm talking about. Channel three was for video games, right? Four was NBC. Five was KTLA. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Nine was KCAL. right? Seven was ABC. Anyway, so they left me unsupervised with the television. And one, uh, while I was there, I had the remote, and I, uh, I somehow found, I don't know how I found it, but it was Pet Cemetery. Yeah. Yes. This is scary, right? And I'm like, oh, it looks, seems like a nice movie. And then by the end, I'm like, oh. And so by the time, um, it scarred me so much that when I was 25, 26, my, our family pet died. And my dad was like, should we bury him in the backyard? I'm like, no. We don't know if we live on tribal burial grounds. We can't do it. And so ever since then, I, I, uh, to this day, I refuse to watch a Stephen King movie. I just, I can't. I've been too traumatized. Uh, so anyway, good. Good to know. Learned a lot about you guys. That's great. All right. Well, my name is Isaac. I'm one of the pastors here at Echo Church. Uh, whether you're new or you've been here for a while, it's really nice to see you. Really nice to worship with you in the name of the Lord. Amen. All right, so we're going to continue with our Galatians series, but before we do, let's pray. And if uh, I did this a couple weeks ago, but if you guys can, uh, for a couple minutes, let's pray in our own words, our own prayers, and then we'll invite the Holy Spirit to come. Okay, let's pray. Holy Spirit, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. We ask you, Lord, a local body in your world uh, to come. We ask you to speak, to make the scriptures come alive to us, to make it relevant and real to us. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. We ask you to animate the Holy Bible that you would make it come alive to our hearts and to our minds, that it would be a word for this church. And it would be a word for each of us. Holy Spirit, we love you. Father, we worship you. And Jesus, it's in your strong name we pray. Amen. The title of today's message, Sleepless in Sinai. Any Tom Hanks fans? One person, thank you, Michael. All right, we're reading. We are still in Galatians chapter 4. We will be in Galatians chapter 4 till the end of time. Just kidding. Today's the last day. We'll be in Galatians chapter 4. And today we are reading, who said woo? Yes. Uh, Tim, it cannot wait to get out of chapter 4. All right, so we're reading from verses 21 to 31 and follow along on the screen. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. 
His son, oops, I'm sorry. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Everyone say Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now, you, brothers and and sisters like Isaac are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave's woman's son will never share in the inheritance of the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Uh, this is the word of the Lord. So if you've been here for the past few months, we have been talking about Galatians and what is going on within this church, this local church uh, that Paul is writing to because Paul has heard news. He's heard um, distressing news about this church. And, and, and this church in some ways is going through an identity crisis. Uh, you see at this time, the, the Jewish Christians in Galatia are the more senior or le- longer standing members of this church. And they began to follow Jesus. And what happens is that these non-Jewish people or these uh, non-Judaic heritage people have come into the church and they're called Gentiles. And, And the Jewish people... Uh, out of anxiety or out of uh, a response to how the church that they once knew is changing are now beginning to put some uh, some additives onto what it means to follow Jesus. And they say, if you're going to follow Jesus, you must, you must be circumcised. And circumcision is a cultural or it's a, uh, it's very specific to their ethnic heritage. And what they're doing now is they're now adding or superimposing a secondary a requirement to following Jesus apart from following Jesus in faith alone. And what do we find? We find Paul has heard of this and Paul be angry. Okay? And what Paul says to them, this argument he's been making for the past four chapters, is he's saying to them that this thing that they've added on to the gospel, the good news, which is that God came to seek and save the lost, to invite them into the kingdom of heaven, so long as you're willing to follow Jesus and do his ways. And what do we find? Paul is saying to them, what you're doing, this additive, you're making additional requirements onto the gospel, is actually not Christian at all. It's actually very anti-Christ. And here we come to chapter 4. Now, Paul is writing very specifically now to a subsection of the church. He's writing to the Jewish Christians, and he's writing to them because they, by virtue of tenure, by virtue of longevity, are the ones with the most power and authority in the church. Right, And we know this, and we know he's writing to the Jewish Christians because he's using very distinct terms and stories that only Jewish people would know. Okay, In verse 23, he mentions, if we have that, the two sons of Abraham. Okay, And he says this, his son by the slave woman, he's talking about Abraham here, was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. Now, uh, as I've said before, in order for us to really understand what any cross-reference or what um, the Bible Project calls hyperlinks, when, when Paul makes a reference to another story, it's always helpful for us to read what the original story says. And so if you can turn with me, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Genesis chapter 16. And Genesis chapter 16 says this. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. 
but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord, now watch this if you're taking notes, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram said, that's disgusting. I would never do that. No, he doesn't. He says, Abram agreed to what Sarah said. Bad decision. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So in this story, what's happened in the chapters before, Abram has had a divine covenant. He's had a divine promise from God. God has told him, leave your homeland, you leave your family, and I want you to come with me. If you leave your homeland, I will give you children, even though your family is old, even though you and your wife are old, I will give you children, and they will be children of miracles, Right? And he says to them, as long as you do this, as long as you abide by this covenant, I will give you what your heart desires, right? And so what happens? Now in chapter 16, we begin to find Abram and Sarai. It's been many years later. They are still childless in their their old age. Can we put that back up? And and look at what Sarai says. Uh, Yeah, can we go to the first slide? I'm sorry. Now look at what Sarai says. She says, the Lord has kept me from having children. Now, who was the one that gave the promise to Sarai to begin with? It was the Lord, right? Now, look, already she's been waiting some time, and now look how the narrative has begun to change. God gave me a promise. Hasn't happened yet. So now, who is the culprit? The Lord is the culprit, even though it was the Lord's idea to begin with for them to have a child in the first place, okay? So we find, what do we find? We find that they haven't had this child. And so what do they do? They begin to compensate. They take matters into their own hands. Instead of waiting patiently on God's promise, instead of waiting for God's word to come fulfilled, what happens? Sarai has this idea. Hagar, my slave, is younger. She's more able to have children. So maybe what the Lord meant to do was for me to give you my slave and you can sleep with the slave and then the child can be produced that way, right? And what do we find? They, they do have a child. His name is Ishmael, but it's not the child that God had promised to them. And we know this because God made the promise to Abram and Sarai, not to Abram and Hagar. Are you with me? Yeah, okay. So what Paul is referencing here in this letter, when he's talking about the Galatians, he's saying what you are doing with circumcision, with this insistence on Jewish rituals and habits, you are now beginning to take uh, this promise. You're actually not children of Sarai and Abram. You're actually children of Hagar because you are trying to make things happen by your own strength. You are trying to make things happen by your own will. You are not listening to the leading of the spirit and instead you are doing what seems right to you instead of doing what the Lord commanded you. Sorry, I got really intense. And so what happens? What happens? Abram has now begun to compensate out of his anxiety, out of his lack of results. Abram now begins to produce and create not out of God's leading but out of his own Lack out of his own lack and his own desire. And the, and the argument that Paul is making right now to the Galatians is that this insistence, that this insistence that the Jewish Galatians had of making Gentiles get circumcised, abide by Jewish customs and rituals, that is tantamount to slavery. Now, as we examine this passage, there is one problem that we find the Galatians and by, or uh, Abraham and then by extension the Galatians, we find that they're confronted with. And it is their inability to deal with anxiety. Let me hear you say anxiety. Just hearing the word anxiety gives me anxiety. So if you look closely at Abraham's life, even though uh, throughout scripture he's known as a hero of the faith, His entire life, if you look at his whole life, it's marked by constant incidences of anxiety. And actually, the Hagar incident is just one of many, right? God instructs Abraham to leave his homeland. He says, just take your wife and your servants with you and just go. And then Abraham goes, that's a great idea. 
I'm also going to take my, my nephew Lot with me because I'm an old man and, a, and if I don't have a son in this new land that you're leading me to, I'm going to look like I'm cursed. So what does he do? He takes Lot with him. Lot settles in Sodom and Gomorrah and we all know that story. Abraham goes to Egypt during a famine and while he's in Egypt, he lies to the Pharaoh at the time and he says, Sarah, don't say you're my wife. Say you're my sister. That way he won't kill me. And then he goes to another land named Gerar, and he meets a king named Abimelech, okay? And he says the same thing, Sarah, let's do it again. Just tell the king you're my sister and not my wife. And then after years of waiting for the promised child, we find he still doesn't have the child that God promised him. So what does he do? He goes, I'll sleep with the slave of my wife. That's how I'll make these things happen. So in fact, when you look at Abraham's life, his whole life, every bad decision he's made, every misstep he's made, all the trouble he's produced for himself in his own life are due to his anxiety. And the comparison that Paul is making in this passage is he's comparing, he's correlating Abraham's behavior with Hagar to the behavior of these Galatians, these Jewish Galatians. And he's saying to them, that both of these parties, Abraham and you Galatians, both of you are anxious and in your anxiety to the unknown and to the unexpected of what's happening in this church, you are now beginning to act in ways that are counter to the good news of Jesus Christ. In doing so, we find that Abram and the narrative of Abram and the narrative of the Galatians, they are operating under a very specific, prominent question. And the question is this, what if God isn't good? How would I live if I knew God was not good? If God wasn't going to come true on his promise? John Mark Homer it says it like this. He says, anxiety is temporary atheism. Anxiety is temporary atheism. Many of you know, uh, actually some of you still don't know, uh, but many of you know that I stepped down from full-time staff here at Echo Church, right? Everyone, right? Everyone knows that? Yeah, some people were like, I thought you still worked there. Uh, no, no, it's been a few months. Uh, back in April, I felt, a, I felt a leading. I felt, or actually earlier than that, I felt a leading from the Lord. And my wife and I talked about it, and we prayed about it, and we felt like this was God, right? And so at the end of April, you know, uh, I, I had resigned. I stepped down from the church, and my wife and I started praying for my job. And at the time, when people would ask me, they're like, how do you feel? I'd be like, I feel great, Okay? Because I have a master's degree which is in, in divinity, which is like useless, right? And then, and then they're, like, people are like, what is that? What, what does that even mean? Um, and then I'm like, I have certificates. I've worked at this church for almost nine years, which is about nine times longer than the average tech worker, right? And so I'm like, I have all this experience. I have longevity. I'll be fine. Don't even worry about me. And then the first three weeks... I applied and I interviewed and nothing came out. And I said, it's cool, man. God is with us. God is with us. And then by the fourth week, I started getting really anxious, right? And um, I even signed up for LinkedIn Premium, which who does that, right? And uh, like, who pays for that? Um, so, uh, uh, so I, I, and by the fourth week, I started getting really anxious, right? And so I started applying for everything. I started applying for things, like before I was applying for like executive positions and this and that. And then by the fourth week, I'm applying for jobs that are like, they're like obviously scams, but I'm like, but it could be, right? <laughs> like one of them was like, work at home, make six figures. I'm like, I'm at home. <laughs> I could make six figures. Like, it could have been, it might as well have been, like, you guys know, like, way back in the day when email was first invented, and then a certain prince would, would email you and say, for $500, I can get my inheritance back. It was pretty much like that, right? And so, so I'm applying, I'm applying, and then by the sixth week, I actually have a timeline of this. The sixth week, my wife and I have a, uh, a marriage counseling session. This is just a check-in that we do every month. And the therapist asks me, she goes, how is the job search going? And I go... You know, and I, and I just realized, uh, like, right before, it was like God really wanted to just wake me up. But um, LinkedIn has a feature where it'll show you how many jobs you've applied for. Do you guys know this? 
it, it also shows how many jobs you didn't get, right? So pretty much all of them. And so uh, I told the therapist, well, as of today, I've applied for 450 jobs. And my therapist goes, you have a problem, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I just remember in this time, like I, uh, when I was applying, and I'd feel so down. I'd be like, oh, like, I'd be so stressed that I, all I could do at the end of the day was take a nap. Have you ever been that stressed? And then there would be times I'd be asking my wife, I'm like, Grace, do you think I'm a loser because I don't have a job yet? And she goes, no, of course not. And I'd be like, okay. But seriously, do you think I'm a loser? And she goes, I'm going to kill you right now. <laughs> and so... There'd be times during the season, now, praise God, I have a job. Don't worry, okay, I have a job. But, but there was times during that season where uh, my life had not produced the results that I had hoped for. The promise that I thought was coming from God was happening on my timeline. And so what do I find? I find myself compensating, acting anxiously, almost about to become part of a pyramid scheme, almost about to be part of this or be part of that. And out of my anxiety, we find what? I could have derailed my life. I could have delayed my life. I could have missed out on the opportunity God had for me. I could have set my kids back. I could have done all these things, jeopardized my entire life if I succumbed to anxiety. Are you with me? Now, I want to make a note that there is a big difference between having anxiety and reacting anxiously out of anxiety. That's repetitive, but you know what I mean. There is a difference between being anxious, and we're all, by the way, all of us are going to be anxious. If you're a human being, you will be anxious at one point in your life. The sin is not, or the misstep is not being anxious. The misstep is acting out of that anxiety and acting in such a way that is counter to the intentions and the purposes of God. So many of you are listening to this and you're thinking, well, what's the harm of reacting anxiously? What's the harm in signing up for LinkedIn Premium? I had to cancel it right away, right before the three-month period ended. Uh, what, what is the harm? What's the harm if I just take that job? What's the harm if I just buy that thing? What's the harm if I date this person that I know is not right for me, but I do it anyway? What's the harm in manipulating my situation? And the harm and the importance of this is because of this. The, when you look at Abraham's story, when you see how many times he succumbs to anxiety and worry and stress in his life, his behavior is not limited to just himself. Meaning every time Abraham reacts anxiously or he reacts in response to an unknown or unexpected event in his life, what we find happening is not only he suffers, but those around him suffer. For instance, in scripture it says that Abraham lies to Pharaoh, lies to Abimelech, right? He, ha he later has his promised son Isaac. And what does Isaac do later in his adult life after he's married? Isaac goes to Abimelech and does the exact same thing that his father did. And he lies and he says, my, my wife is not my wife, she's my sister. Poor Abimelech, right? The guy's just sitting there. And then later, Isaac has a son and he, he has two boys. Do you guys know their names? Esau and Jacob. Do you know what the literal translation of Jacob is? Liar. His dad loved him so much he called him liar, right? So... And not only within his family, not only generationally, but if you look at the scriptures, Pharaoh and his household suffered suffer uh, diseases because Abraham is deceptive, right? Abimelech's whole household suffers from infertility until Abraham prays for him, okay? And what happens to Hagar? Hagar, who through no fault of her own, is forced to bear this child because of Abraham and Sarai's uh, anxiety, Hagar is sent away with her son. She's mistreated, she's tossed aside, and she's simply used for what she can produce rather than for who she is. There are ripple effects happening to all the people around Abram, all the people coming after Abram. All the people surrounding him seem to suffer in one way or another when he gives into anxiety. And remember, the calling that God had for Abram was not be blessed so that you can just be blessed. He says, I will bless you so that you can be a, a blessing unto the world. 
And what we find is every time Abraham gives in to his anxiety, every time he falls short of God's purpose and intentions for him, every time he reacts out of worry, his calling and his purpose get compromised. We find that an inability to control anxiety and the tendency to control your life by all means necessary will inevitably lead to a distortion of your representation of God, hurt and misuse by the anxious party towards others around them, and major life decisions driven by fear rather than conviction. So, If we are called not to be anxious or not to respond out of anxiety, the inevitable question is, how do we live or how do we act? And here, Paul writes to someone else. He he writes, and his instruction to them is to become people of rest. Let me hear you say people of rest. People of rest. Become people of rest rather than reactivity. So Philippians 4 says this. And this is the message version. He says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns before you know it. A sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. What is Paul's instruction to the church? He's saying, don't worry, don't get anxious, don't respond out of your anxiety and worry. Instead, pray. But don't just pray in tongues 24-7, asking for the Lord to do that, which is good, by the way. You you should pray in tongues, not 24-7, but you should pray in tongues. He's not saying do it out of anxiety. He's saying when you pray, pray in such a way that the Lord displaces that anxiety from out of your life and you can trust that God is at work in whatever you're worried about. Paul doesn't instruct us to act reactively or, or quickly or anxiously. He instead instructs us to allow what we ask for and what we're thankful for to transform our anxieties into prayer. Not prayer as an activity or a means to solving the problem, but prayer as a means to transform our posture. Because becoming people of rest means that we offer up our worries and our anxieties and our frustrations to God, knowing that God cares far more about the things we're worried about than we can ever imagine or think of. And because we know God cares, we know God is the one already at work about the thing that we're thinking about. In other words, Paul is asking us to live by a new question. How would I live if I knew God cared more than I could imagine? How would I live if I knew God was already at work ahead of me, around me, inside me? How would I live? How would I act? What would I do with my money? What would I do with my time? It sounds easy, right? And the truth is, it is easy. The biggest struggle you and I will have in this life, friends, is that we will feel the temptation to always respond quickly or to always cry out or to do this or do that, right? So I don't know why I'm doing that. Many of us will feel the response to quick motion, right? Quick motion out of anxiety. The biggest thing that we will have to do, the biggest thing that will keep us on track in our story with the Lord is whether or not we're willing to allow God to handle the things that we cannot control. When I was younger, uh, not like younger, younger, like 20-something, um, I remember, or, or 30-something, I, I remember when my kids were babies and Mondays would be, always be my day off. And so uh, I'd watch the kids at home while my wife went off to work and um, at the time, they would drink breast milk, right? And so uh, every, I feel like every family has this. It ha- there's this thing where you uh, take cold milk and you put it in there and it steams it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? It steams it and then it steams it to just the right temperature so that the milk is at drinking temperature. And it's also hot enough to burn your fingertips off when you go in and get the bottle. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, just me, I guess. Uh, and so I remember every time, every Monday, I'd be watching my kids and I'd be and inevitably, every three hours, right, my kids would be hungry, start crying, and start making that sound, you know, like dogs make, like, 
And just my kid, Velociraptor, is that just my kid? Um, and so every few hours, I remember on the dot, it was on the dot, and I'd take this bottle and I'd stick it in the warmer, and it's always a minute and a half, okay? It had to be 90 seconds for some reason. And so in the midst of that 90 seconds, I remember my kids would always freak out, right? Like, like as the bottle's warming up, they're like, ah! And then, you know, uh, you have to glove their hands, otherwise they claw themselves in the face. Um, and I remember in that moment, I remember thinking, oh, my kids, my kids just don't know that something is coming. If only they knew something, if I could translate my words into something that they can understand. If only they knew that within 80 more seconds, food would be here. Everything they've been asking for and wanting and they know is good for them will be here. They just have to wait for the right time. Right? Because how many of you know we could put the bottle, take it out early and stick it in and they won't drink it or it won't be good for them. It won't be something that they want. And often, often for many of us, we come to church or we come uh, in prayer to the Lord and we ask and we want this thing now. And often the thing that God says to us is, not now, but soon. Many of us come to the house of, house of God today, uh, yearning and waiting. And many of us have things that are on our mind, taking attention, taking our affection, taking energy from us. Many of us come with uh, desires for the next stage of our life to start, whether it's parenthood or that new job or that new relationship. Some of us are waiting on desires that we know is good, but the Lord hasn't yet offered it or he hasn't yet uh, put it into action. Some of us have friends and families who we are praying desperately for to have an encounter with God. We want them to be saved or we want them to change their way of life or change their trajectory or their direction in life. And it hasn't happened yet. And it, we think about them daily. Or lastly, some of us could be stuck. We feel stuck. We feel like life has been on hold for us, while for the rest of us, life seems to be moving along normally. And if I can make an encouragement to you all, uh, whatever it is that we come with, the temptation is always going to exist for us to make these things happen by our own hand. And God's desire for us is not for us to be productive people or reactive people. It is for us to become people of rest. So I want to try something together if we can. Uh, you know, one practice I used to do, I mentioned my unemployment earlier, but one practice I would do is every, every, uh, every day when after the fourth week, the anxiety would get really bad. So I had a choice. I could either sleep or I could eat. I usually ate. Okay, uh, but I tried to make this a habit where I would um, I'd pray and I would do something that the that the mystics call breath prayer. So the ancient mystics used to believe that um, every breath that we took was in itself an inherent prayer unto God. And they say that the name of God is Yahweh, right? And so um, every breath you took in, it'd be like yeah, and then every breath you exhale, way yeah. And so they would say, every breath you took was in itself a prayer unto the Lord. And so I would take this seriously. But instead of just doing Yahweh for an hour, I, I just thought it would be better to make it a little bit more specific to me. And so what I would do, I used to pray the breath prayer like this. I would start my inhales with something I knew was good about God or true about God. And so in the beginning, I used to pray, God, you're good. <laughs> Most of the time, it was hyperventilating. God, you're good. God, you're good. No, in the beginning, it was, God, you're good. Because I needed it. I don't know why I pray. Don't laugh at me, please. I'm, I'm being very vulnerable right now. Thanks, Heidi. Um, and then I didn't, I didn't inhale. I didn't inhale a, a truth about God or a fact about God. And I, when I didn't inhale, I'd let that percolate into my system. Because I wanted it. I wanted it to be expressed outwardly. Right? And then on my exhale, don't laugh, please. Thank you. Uh, on my exhale, I used to say, um, I will trust you. Right? Sounds a little bit more normal, right? So, God, you're good. I will trust you. 
God, you're good. I will trust you. And what I used to do uh, in, in that past season, it was actually very recent, but this past season, is I'd hold, I'd imagine holding um, every worry, every thought, every anxiety in my hands. And then as I felt the weight lift off of me, I tell the Lord, these things I'm holding, I keep trying to do it by my own strength. I have 450 jobs on LinkedIn that I have not heard back from. I give all 450 of those jobs back to you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I love how people are, I'm being so honest, and people are like, oh, this is hilarious. Um, yeah, so, so I want to invite you to do that with me. There, some of you may come today, and you're like, life is great, and God bless you. Have a great week, okay? Um, for though, but many of us come with things spoken and unspoken that we've been carrying around with us. And um, the intention was never for us to carry them. It was for God to carry them. So if I can invite you, let's get into this posture, okay? And, and you guys can come up with your own prayer, but, or you can use mine that as you breathe in. Oh, you, you can kneel, or you don't have to kneel, or yeah, you can, or just stay where you are. That's fine. You can do whatever you want. Um, uh, but if you can, open up your hands, and let's just do this as a way of closing out the service together, yeah? I want to invite you to imagine or materialize uh, the thing that has been taking so much of your energy and your time and your concern in your hands. And I want you to imagine you're holding them. And you'll, you'll actually come to find that most of the time it, it is actually quite heavy, even though it's imaginary. And as you um, hold those, Inhale with the truth about God. It could be, God, you are trustworthy. God, you are generous. God, you are kind. God, you are here. And as you breathe in, Allow that truth of God to percolate into your system. Allow it to give your body life. Allow it to give your spirit life. To be able to breathe in God's goodness. And as you exhale, pair it with something that is tied to it. God, you are trustworthy. I will rest. God, you are generous. I will give. God, you are loving. I will serve. Let's pray, church. Let's try this together. As you pray, I just want to encourage you, allow the Lord to displace worry at the center of who you are. There's some of you here, there are family members on your heart, 
either they're getting older or there's some other circumstance in them, I just feel the Lord wants to encourage you. That God sees them. God sees them. There are others of you late at night when everyone else is asleep. There are prayers unspoken and you hold them. And I'm reminded of uh, Hannah, the mother, Samuel's mother. She holds it, she treasures it, and she also releases it unto the Lord. Her childlessness, her position in life, her relationships. Go ahead, let the Lord, Holy Spirit, come. Let's just sit in this for a minute, yeah? Let's, let's rest in the Lord together. Before we end today, um, we will have pastors and intercessors here at the front to pray with you. Scripture says that we have to carry our own load, but Scripture also says to share our burdens with one another. And in doing so, we honor Christ. And so if that's you, some of you come and you feel it's so hard to release the thing you've been holding. And our pastors and our intercessors, we want to pray with you. If there's some of you who have been waiting on a, on a promise from God, you've been waiting for something, come up. We want to bless you. Lord, I thank you for this house. I thank you for this church. I thank you, God, for the fact that you are molding them in the image of non-anxiety, that they're becoming non-anxious presences. Lord, I pray right now, every person here holding something, I pray they relinquish it to you knowing that you are a good God who cares far more than we could imagine. And Lord, I pray that in our release, in our relinquishment, that we would come to know the peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I bless this church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May Christ be victorious in your lives. Amen. Amen, church. Have a great week. You're welcome to stay and pray if you'd like to. Uh, If you'd like to receive prayer, we invite you to come up. But otherwise, we bless you in the name of the Lord.